my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, who is Victoria Conti, now known as Victoria Fletcher, since she got married a month ago. So, Victoria, as it says here, is the museum educator and programs coordinator at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And we're very grateful to have her with us. The main purpose of this lecture is to prepare about 300, 350 ACS students. So I know there are students other than ACS students here and faculty too, uh, for going down to the museum. So about, again, 300 students will be going down this, this upcoming weekend and then later in October to see the exhibition Rembrandt in the Face of Jesus. So this is preparation. Victoria's going to tell you about our history. She's going to tell you about how to look at art. She's going to tell you about Rembrandt and his times. And she's going to tell you some about the history of the depiction of Jesus. So the, the connection to the ACS curriculum is especially with Mark. Many of our students this year are reading Mark. And if you've read Mark, you know that, that really the preoccupying question of the beginning of Mark is who Jesus is. Depictions of Jesus speak to that question, and they have an theological significance. So we can make connections with what we're reading and what we're going to see when we go down to the museum. I want to thank some people uh, for making possible this lecture and also our visits down to the museum. It's a big undertaking to do all that. <coughs> I want to thank, to begin with, the Office of Student Life, and especially Kathy Burns and Terry O'Brien, who are just great to work with. They're not here, but I want to say that Kathy Burns and, and Terry O'Brien have done so much to make this possible in terms of funding and also in terms of organizing. I also want to thank the Office of Mission and Ministry, especially Barbara Wall and Beth Hassel. And Beth, I know this year, so thank you very much for your contributions. I want to thank Brian Sirak from Munich, who helped with the taping, and then Sharon Roth to Fabio, who's the technology coordinator in the nursing college, who got all this set up for us. So thank you to all those people. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you very much, Bernard, and thank you very much to, to all of you for coming out today. This is a wonderful turnout. I um, hope I get you excited to go and see the exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Villanova as a whole for allowing me to lecture here for you today. Um, I'm very excited about the exhibition Rembrandt and the Face of Jesus. I had the opportunity to work on it um, on interpretation for it, so I kind of pulled out some of the key themes that um, I thought maybe us who don't know too much about art and don't know too much about the history of religion, um, some key themes that would help um, explain the exhibition a little bit clearer. So I'd like to um, first start off, though, by asking just a few questions. Um, can I get a, a show of hands? Anybody who has some kind of an art history background? Does anybody have some art history? How about an art background? Some, okay. A history background? All right, a few more. And how about um, a religion background? Great. So this, I'm going to, the lecture today is going to combine all four of those disciplines, but I will not assume that you know anything about any of those disciplines. So to begin with, what I'm actually going to do is give you a brief introductory, um, kind of a crash course to art history as a discipline and to what art historians do and what you can do when you're going through the exhibition. So first, art historians, um, and if you're studying art history, it's pretty much two parts. It's the art part. It's what you see. Um, it's how things look and, and how things are made. And then it's also the, the story or the history of the work of art. And so to find out a little bit more about that, I find myself asking just the, the very basic questions. The first of which, who? So we can ask, who was the artist? That's really important, and that'll tell us a little bit more um, about the exhibition as a whole. We can also ask who the patron was. Now the patron is somebody who would have commissioned the work of art or who would have went to the artist and asked <coughs> the artist to create a work of art for them. Sometimes there are patrons, sometimes there are, there are no patrons. Sometimes the artist creates the work just because they want to. Um, we can also ask who is depicted in the work of art. Today the main um, person that we'll see represented in the works of art is Jesus. Um, and then we can also ask who is the intended audience. Are we supposed to understand what we're seeing? Is it supposed to be in a religious context, in a social context? Who, who's supposed to see these works? 
And does the meaning change, maybe, depending on the different people that see the works? Now, we can ask ourselves many other who questions. I'm just going to kind of hit a few bullet points for you today to kind of get your minds wandering. Another question we can ask is what? What is depicted in the work? What do we see? What is the meaning, if any? Um, a lot of times, artwork will have some kind of meaning or some kind of purpose. Um, we can also ask what artistic style the work is made in. How, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Renaissance, yes? Or maybe contemporary art, they're, they're totally different. So maybe there's a certain style that we can identify between the, with the work of art. And then we can also ask what do certain elements of the artwork mean? So are there any, maybe there's hidden symbols that can help us draw out a deeper meaning to the work of art. We can also ask when, when was the work of art created and what historical influences were there? So maybe there were, th there's three main things that I always think of whenever I'm looking at a work of art. What, what's going on socially, what's going on um, in politics, and what's going on with religion at this time? At, at this time, which is the 1600s, religion plays a very prominent role in what artwork was created. And so I take all three of those into consideration. You can expand that very much more as well. We can also ask when in the artist's career the work was created. Artists tend to change their, their artistic styles during their career. And so if we know when it was created, we can maybe understand a little bit more about the artwork. And we can also ask when is the action in the artwork taking place? When are the people who are represented? When are they existing? Sometimes it's the same as, as now. Sometimes it was meant to be in the past, sometimes in the future. We can ask where. Where was this work of art created? Um, the region in which a work of art is created usually has a very important influence about the work of art. The artist would have been influenced by other artistic styles of what else is going on at that time. So where is also really crucial to understanding the work of art. Um, and we can also ask where the action in the artwork is, is taking place, where it's happening, what the setting is in the work of art. We can ask why. Why did the artist create the work of art? Was there a reason? Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. And why did the artist include certain elements in the work of art? Why did they leave certain elements out, maybe? And lastly, we can ask how. Um, how did the artist create the work? So what is the medium? Um, it could be a, a painting, maybe an oil on canvas. It could be a drawing on paper. It could be an etching or an engraving or a sculpture or architecture. So we can ask how the work was created, what the medium is. The medium is, is what, what the work of art is. Um, we can also ask how the artist met the goals, if, if the artist did, in fact, meet their goals. And um, we can ask how was the work of art received by the patron or by the general public. Sometimes um, works of art were created, a lot of times works of art were created, and they were not very well received. They were criticized. Um, they were not liked at all. And so we can ask ourselves, maybe that, that plays a role as well. We can also ask how the work of art looks. And this brings me, so here, here's all of the history to the work of art. Here are all the questions that you can dig deeper. You can ask a little bit more to uncover a hidden meaning. But when we can also then look at the work of art. And so that brings me to then the formal characteristics of a work of art and how to look at a work of art. And so I encourage you as you're going through the exhibition to stop. You're going to see a lot of the artworks are very small. Um, they're meant to be intimate. They're meant for you to go up closely and really contemplate and take a close look at them. And so when you do that, dig a little deeper. Don't just say, don't go up to a work of art and say, oh, I like it, or oh, I, I don't like it, and move on, or oh, I see this, and move on. But actually look at, at some of the formal elements. And I'm going to point those out to you here today, some things that you can look for. One of which is line. So here, for example, we have an image um, of the head of Jesus. And this was by Rembrandt. It's owned by the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And it is in the, the exhibition, Rembrandt and the Face of Jesus. So for instance, if I were to um, comment on the line in this work, I can see a soft kind of curving arch around the shoulders of Jesus. I could also see tight curls, spiraling circles at the bottom part of his hair. We can look at shape. So here we can see there's this great pyramidal shape coming from the bottom left all the way to the top center and then down to the bottom right. So we can see that there's one triangle form that's being formed. We can also, if we look at the face, it almost kind of makes this triangle form as well, just an opposite triangle with his face. So we can comment on the shape. And when we look a little bit deeper, we can kind of understand, oh, well, maybe, maybe he was meant to be portrayed this way for a certain reason. Or maybe that le leads us to understand the body and the pose in a certain way. We can also observe color. 
Now, you're not always going to be able to observe color, especially in the exhibition, as there are numerous drawings and prints which are solely black and white. But um, in instances like this, this painting here, we can look at color. There isn't much to look at, though, color-wise. It's a lot of browns, a lot of neutral colors. And yet we can see that in the background here, the background is this darker brown color with a little bit of a, a yellowish tint, a yellow, little bit of a highlight almost, or a spotlight um, in the back. It's very subtle, but it's still there. And we can also see the um, graduated brown tones also within um, the, the cloak that Jesus is wearing within the hair as well. We can see that the skin tone is a little bit lighter. It's a little bit um, pale as well. We can also look at lightness, darkness, shadowing. And this is actually very prominent in a lot of Rembrandt's works. He's known for what's, co what's called chiaroscuro, which means this contrast between lights and darks. So you'll see, as I show you some of the works in the exhibition, you'll see this sharp contrast between the lights and the darks. And we can see here, there isn't too much of a contrast. Really, his face is the most lit area, and everything else is thrown into shadows. But we can also see that there's this light source coming from the top left of the composition here. And this casts shadows then on, on this right side of Jesus' face here. So it casts these shadows that cast the right side of his body also in a deeper sh shadow than the, the other side of his body. Texture. We can also look at texture. And Rembrandt also does really wonderful things, especially in his prints and drawings, to create this sense of texture, almost like we can touch it and, and feel it. And so we can see that the, his beard is meant to be this coarse beard. And the hair is, is shiny and, and probably would be flowy and more softer than the beard. And then we can also look at composition. So I talked about the background a little bit, the brown, flat background in the back. And then we have this figure um, of Jesus. And this is called the foreground. Whatever is in the, the front of the picture plane of a work of art would be considered the foreground. So here we have probably the the front of his cloak here and the front of his face, his nose would be in the foreground, and more the back of his head and the arch of his, sh of his shoulders would be more of the middle ground, and then we would process even further back into the space, into the background. And as this is a little bit hard because it's a portrait, but as I show you more works of art where there are numerous, numerous characters and numerous objects in the work of art, you'll be able to see much more depth to the work of art. So those are just some things to keep in mind. When looking at a work of art, when asking yourself questions about a work of art, and we're trying to understand how to, how to see a work of art and how to get um, as much as you can out of it. Now I'm going to also give you, how many of you have heard of Rembrandt before? How many of you have heard of Rembrandt before you, you knew you were going to see the exhibit? OK, good. Still a decent amount of you. That's, that's wonderful. He is um, probably considered to be the greatest painter, the greatest drawer, um, draftsman, and the greatest printmaker of the Dutch Golden Age. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more about that in, in a few minutes. But he was, he was it. I mean, everybody knew him. Everybody knew his name. He was greatly acclaimed by um, his patrons, by his, his peers as well. He was born in 1606 in Leiden, which was a university town in the Dutch Republic, which is nowadays known as the Netherlands. And um, he was the ninth child. His family was actually a very prosperous family. His father was a prosperous miller, and his mother was a baker's um, daughter. And so he grew up on a, in a pretty well-to-do family. He attended university for a few years. Um, and then he, he always loved painting. And so um, it was then decided that he should go and apprentice with um, other painters. And so he, he studied under them. He learned um, their techniques and their styles um, as well. Now here I've, this is not in the exhibition, this is probably the only or, or one of the only works that I have in the presentation that is not in the exhibition, but I wanted to include a self-portrait so you can kind of envision who this Rembrandt was that is, is creating all of the works that you'll see in the exhibition. So this is a self-portrait, he's, we have his easel right here, we have his brushes here, his paint, and so he's depicting himself as what he loves to do the best, um, what he's known as, and that is an artist. Um, and so we can see that he, um, he, he does numerous self-portraits throughout his career, but this is one of them. And this is actually more towards the later, later part of his life. Um, now, he was born in 1606, and about at the age of 25, he moved to, um, to Amsterdam. And this was a really bustling port city, and there was a lot of merchants, a lot of trading, um, a really um, a lot of ships that would come in and out and trade from all across the world, all Asia um, as well. And so he then, um, he moved to Amsterdam, 
And he worked on commissions for a lot of different patrons. He worked on commissions for royal courts, for the, the prosperous middle class as well. Um, a few years after, he became a, a citizen of Amsterdam, and he also married his wife, Saskia. That was in 1634. And about five years later, um, they decided to purchase a house, and they actually purchased a huge house um, for 13,000 guilders. And I apologize, I do not know the equivalent to that, but it was an astronomical sum to pay for a house at that time. And he did it, and he took out loans, and he was going to pay it all off, and, and um, he didn't pay it all off, and we'll get to that later as well. Um, but he really, he purchased this huge house, and there were bedrooms, and there were, um, there were studios that he could work in, numerous studios, and um, it really was a prosperous house um, to be in. And it was in a really good neighborhood as well. It was an artist neighborhood. Um, and he also, the neighborhood was also home to um, a, wide, a wide range of Jewish communities. Um, and um, so he became friends with his Jewish neighbors, and they then influenced his artwork too, which I will get to in a few minutes. Now here, just to show you a picture, this is the, the front, the facade of the Rembrandt House, which is currently today the Rembrandt House Museum in Amsterdam. Has anybody been to the Rembrandt House Museum? Great, great, a few of you. Um, and so they've, they've kept it to kind of be the same, the same look and the same feel as it was during Rembrandt's time, but this gives you a little bit of an idea here. Here's the street view out here. He, like I said, he was very well acclaimed um, by, by others at this time, by his patrons, by the public, um, by his peers. But despite all of his really wonderful artistic contributions, he really had a life full of turmoil as well. His wife, Saskia, predeceased him as well as three of his four children. Um, actually, all of his children. Three of the four children um, didn't survive past infancy. And the fourth predeceased him by about a year. Um, he was later involved in legal entanglements with, um, resulting from an affair that he had with the family nurse. And um, she sued him, and he eventually had her um, acquitted to an asylum. And then he also, in 15, 1656, he went bankrupt. Um, and this was due in a large part, first he bought this humongous house that he never, I mean, really, if he totally managed his finances, he would have been able to afford it. But he was not very good at managing his finances. He was an avid collector of the arts and created other works of art by other artists. Um, he would sometimes outbid his works of art as well. Um, and actually, if I could just have a little <laughs> tiny bit of light, I don't even know who. I know. Well, if. Just a little bit, if that's OK. <laughs> but anyway, I'll continue. Oh. Well, welcome back. Um, so he, regardless, he was an avid collector of the arts. He would collect weapons and armor and shells and all kinds of curiosities, and he would use them in his artwork as models to incorporate in his artwork. He had an, um, a studio room, a few studio rooms in his place, and he had a lot of um, people who actually worked in his studio. He had a lot of pupils. He had 50 throughout his career, which is an astronomical amount as well, to have that many people working under you and your studio and learning from you. Um, as well. Now he died in 1669 um, and at the end of his career it's thought that he had um, painted about 300 paintings, he had um, about three, completed 300 prints and over 2,000 drawings. So his output was really huge at this time. I mean he really contributed a great deal to the Dutch um, art world at this time. Now to go back to talk about, so now we're going to talk about a little bit about the social, um, political, all of that that was going on at that time that would have influenced Rembrandt. So the golden age of Dutch art, which really roughly spans the entire 17th century, and Rembrandt was working and living for most of that, um, it was a really affluent time for the Dutch economy. Dutch trade was really big, science was big, art was big, military, banking, all of these things had really taken off. Um, and these trade empires that I talked about as well really fueled economic prosperity. There were a lot of trades that people could become involved in, and so we see this rise of the merchant class. A lot of times before this and in other parts of the world, there was an aristocracy or a king and a queen who ruled. And in this case, we really see the rise of the merchant class. People are starting to make their own money, and they want to show off their wealth. And so they, um, they would commission artists to, create, to make portraits of themselves or to paint their homes or whatever the case and, and to really kind of show off their wealth and their importance. 
Um, popular art subjects were landscapes, were history paintings, were still life paintings, were scenes from everyday life, were portraits, and yet there, were still, um, there was still quite a bit of um, religious imagery as well, although not as much as before. Um, at this time, the, um, the Dutch area was, was really home to what is the Protestant Reformation. And so this really kind of um, put a ban on imagery that could be considered um, idols, false idols. They really had this ban on worshiping false idols, and so they got rid of a lot. They destroyed a lot of artwork in churches. And so you don't have the church as a huge patron of the arts. And before this, the church really was a huge patron of the arts. So you miss some of that. But yet Rembrandt, even despite of this, was still really inspired and interested in biblical imagery, particularly that of depicting Jesus. And so here we have, um, back again to the Philadelphia Museum of Art's head of, of Jesus. And so to give you a little bit of an introduction to the themes of the exhibit. So really the exhibit, um, this is the second stop of three stops. It started off at the Musée de Louvre in Paris. It now is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art until the end of October. And then it will be going to the Detroit Institute of Art. And it really is a collection of paintings, drawings, and prints from various collections across Europe and across the United States. And many of which, it's really um, special actually, many of these have never or rarely been exhibited before or loaned out for exhibitions before. Now the exhibit marks the first time that a substantial group of paintings by Rembrandt is in Philadelphia. So we've had paintings but never an exhibition that had as many paintings as we do now. Um, now the main idea of the exhibition and the focus of a lot of the artwork, and, and you'll see a flow through the exhibition, really focuses around this new portrayal of Jesus that Rembrandt is, is seeking to uncover. He focuses on a series of sketches um, by, made by Rembrandt and his studio between the years of 1648 and 1656. And he really concentrates on this more human, less idealized face of Jesus. We have these traditions that extend way far back, these um, very iconic representations of Jesus that many artists would have employed. And Rembrandt, for the first half of his life, maybe even more, really embraces those traditions. Um, he depicts Jesus as canonically as he should um, by a certain set of features and characteristics. And he instead tries to push the envelope by making the scenes a little bit more dramatic, a little bit more emphasis on the light and the dark, a little bit more theatrical as well. Um, and later, though, in his life, um, so this is after his wife had died, um, before his bankruptcy, he, had, he really saw this turn in how he wanted to represent Jesus. And he instead really decided to go against the way that traditionally Jesus had been represented before, and instead really embrace this more intimate, more natural, more um, human and empathetic portrayal of Jesus. And we can really see that in, in the artwork here. Um, He's not bold, he's not showy, he's not musculature or, or really um, this great godlike figure. We can't see that. We really see the kind of this intimate, humid human um, that we can empathize with, that, that is showing us his emotions um, as well. Um, the, the subject matter in the faces of Jesus also appear in some of his other works of art. Um, two of his most famous paintings um, incorporate the face of Jesus based on the faces of Jesus, which I'll show you later on. So these sketches here are then taken and incorporated into other works of art that Rembrandt is creating. Um, and the exhibit is also really unique because it reunites six of eight original faces of Jesus. And before this exhibition, they had never, the last time they were all together was in 1656 when Rembrandt had to declare bankruptcy and everything was sold. So since 1656, these works have never been seen together before. And so it really provides an opportunity for us to go up close and to study them and look at them and see the differences and really kind of ask questions about what Rembrandt was trying to do. Now, the exhibition is, is ooh, here we go, is set up um, really in eight different sections. Um, and so I'm going to walk you through each of them now. And you'll see that as you go into the exhibit as well. We have the, first the introduction and the biography. And then we have envisioning the face of Jesus. And so the primary sources that would, have inspired Jesus, or that would have inspired Rembrandt and other artists at the time. We have Jesus in Rembrandt's early works. So earlier when I talked about how artists tended to um, 
sometimes changed the way they depicted things throughout their career. Well, here we have a wonderful instance of that. Rembrandt is portraying Jesus one way in the early part of his career and at the later end of his career, just totally um, going for a, a very different Jesus. Um, fourth, we have Rembrandt's Amsterdam. What's going on at the time? What the community is like? What, um, what the religion is like? I mean, all of that. What, what is Amsterdam at the time that Rembrandt is creating these images? Um, about midway through the exhibition, we have a room fully devoted to the faces of Jesus. Um, and so you can walk up really close. They're really beautifully lit, um, they're almost a spotlight effect. Um, and you can, you can see them one after the other after the other. Um, we then wander into Rembrandt and the 100 Gilder print. And the 100 Gilder print is probably his most famous, um, most impressive print that he created. Um, so of a large size, and it's named the 100 Gilder, it's not its real name, what, what it was originally intended to. It's called the 100 Gilder print because somebody paid 100 Gilders, which was uh, an absurd amount of money at that time for one print um, to purchase that print. So there's a room devoted to that um, and to some of those influences, as well as a really unique printmaking video, kind of in an offshoot of the gallery that I encourage you all to take a look at. I don't know um, how much, you probably don't know very much about printmaking. Um, and it really breaks down the process. We recruited a, um, a student from the Fleischer um, to really bring us step by step and show us how a print is done. And so the video is really threefold. It shows us how a print is made. It talks about Rembrandt as a printmaker. And it also discusses the importance of the 100 Gilder print. We also then um, kind of wander into the next room, and, and that's Rembrandt and the story of Emmaus, which is his most famous biblical story to portray in his works of art. And we'll see that, you will see that numerous times throughout the exhibition, and I'm going to show you two examples of that today. And then um, we also then, we end up in Jesus in Rembrandt's late work. So we kind of see this contrast between the early and the late work. So I'll leave that up for another second. I'm just going to have a sip of water. Now I um, essentially have given you the introduction and biography um, on a grander scale than you'll probably get in the exhibition, but you'll see um, really what the exhibition is about as well as the artist's biography in the exhibit. Um, and now what I want to do is really focus on the primary sources. Um, and really um, in Rembrandt's time, the way that, that an artist depicted um, Jesus was really passed down um, from one artist to the other, and it was based off of two unique images, one of which was the Mandilion, the other one was the Veil of Veronica. And they were both um, cloths that had preserved the face of Jesus when Jesus had come, when Jesus' face had, had pressed the cloth against him. And so it preserves this image, and so what's unique about that is it is, um, it's an image that is not created by human hand. I mean, it would be great if we knew what Jesus looked like, but there were no cameras back then. There wasn't anybody who was sketching him in their notebooks or anything to that effect. So we really, um, artists relied on these sources that um, supposedly showed Jesus' face on, on these um, cloths. So these, both of these works are from the Philadelphia Museum of Art permanent collection, and they both are included in the exhibition. The one on the left is by Robert Campan, and he was a northern, um, northern early Netherlandish artist who pre-lived um, Rembrandt by about 200 years. Um, and we can see that he's following this canonical representation of Jesus. And then we have, on the flip side of that, so we have Northern Europe and then we have Southern Europe. We have Bernardino Zaganelli, and he was an Italian artist. And he um, created this work of the Vale of Veronica in um, roughly five, 1500. And so they both are, are pretty similar, even though they're created at, at different times and at very different areas of the world. Um, and yet they still are based on this idea of this, this cloth image that would have captured Jesus. The Mandilion um, is more of an Eastern, um, Eastern, I guess, trope. And they, according to the story, King Agbar of Edessa, which is modern-day Turkey, was sick. And so he asked Jesus to come, come and help him. And, and Jesus couldn't make it, but he pressed um, a wet, damp cloth to his face and gave it to his messenger who brought it to the king, and it cured him. It had some miraculous powers. And so um, this was then lost and then, and then recovered, and, and the cloth um, was then used as a model to represent Jesus. 
Um, similarly, the veil of Veronica was carried um, by Veronica, who accompanied Jesus in Jerusalem as he was carrying his cross and walking to the crucifixion. And she wanted to wipe off the suffering from his face and clean the sweat off his face. And so she pressed her cloth against his face and it left this imprint as well. And this, again, was lost and then resurfaced in the Middle Ages. And this was copied numerous times um, as well by artists. And so both of these would have been known by Rembrandt. Both of them would have informed him as well as his creating these works of Jesus. Now we also have a written source that describes Jesus as well. Um, and it was thought to have been written during Jesus' lifetime. It was um, attributed to Publius Lentulus, who was believed to be the governor of Judea before Pontius Pilate, who saw Jesus and wanted to report on what he looked like to the Roman Senate. And so here we have a description of, of what Jesus looked like, written by Lentulus. And I've highlighted all of the actual physical attributions. So if we read along, his hair is the color of a ripe hazelnut parted on top in the manner of the Nazarites and falling straight to the ears, but curling further below with blonde highlights and fanning off his shoulders. He has a fair forehead and no wrinkles or marks on his face. His cheeks are tinged with pink. His beard is large and full, but not long and parted in the middle. His glance shows simplicity adorned with maturity. His eyes are clear and commanding, never apt to laugh, but sooner inclined to cry. In sum, he is the most beautiful of all mortals. And so this text was published, it was passed down, and again, Rembrandt would have known this at this time. It was doubted by some Christians at the time of Rembrandt, but he nevertheless would have known it and would have looked to it as a source as well um, for his creations of his early <coughs> Jesus figures. Now here we have a representation of Jesus, a little bit before Rembrandt's time, it's by Cornelis Cornelis um, van Harlem, and it's the Man of Sorrows. And here we see, again, very similar to the other faces of Jesus that I just showed you, um, with the, the, the beard parted in the middle, this very symmetrical face. We can see this brown hair, almost these curls as well. So the face is very traditional, nothing, nothing that extraordinary or different about the face here. And yet what's interesting is how he's portrayed the body of Jesus. Jesus has muscles. He has abs. He's really physically fit. Um, he's almost this godlike physique, which is very interesting because he's carrying the cross. He would have been tortured. He should have had um, wounds and, and blood and, and really this grotesque body. And instead, um, what, what the artist has chosen to do is really rid him of all of that. He doesn't want to show him as how he really was. He wants to create this idealized picture of Jesus. So the face is very traditional. It wouldn't have caused anybody to stir. And this body is nice to look at. I mean, it's not going to make anybody cringe as well. And so I want you to keep this idealized Jesus in mind as we look at some of Rembrandt's um, depictions of Jesus, especially his later ones, where he really is trying to capture this realism. Now the next section, so I'm kind of walking you through the exhibit, the next section is Jesus in Rembrandt's early works. And Jesus was really interested in depicting stories from the Bible. He depicted Old Testament stories, New Testament stories, Apocrypha stories. And um, he really wanted to um, satisfy all the demands from all of his patrons. He had Christian, um, Catholic patrons, he had Protestant patrons, he had Jewish patrons as well. He lived in this really robust Jewish community um, and so they, they wanted this Old Testament imagery as well. And so he really kind of pulled a lot of stories out and depicted a lot of various biblical people as well. But um, the Supper at, at Emmaus, um, like I said before, is really his favorite. And he really portrays that over and over again throughout his career. The story of the Supper at Emmaus is really the story of Jesus' journey to Emmaus. And it's in the, um, the book, the Gospel of Luke. And so two pro pilgrims which we see here, and I'm going to kind of give you the background of this scene here. So there's two pilgrims, which were um, Jesus' disciples, were walking along the road to Edessa, I'm sorry, to Emmaus, and um, he, they met Jesus along the road. Now, this was the resurrected Jesus, but they did not recognize him, not yet. And so they were talking to Jesus, and they discussed the sadness of what had happened to Jesus, and they then invited him to dinner with them. And so here we see the supper at Emmaus, and Rembrandt has showed us the moment where while they're eating dinner, Jesus is breaking the bread, and at that precise moment, the disciples 
recognize Jesus. And so there's this moment of recognition. And right at that instant that they recognize Jesus, Jesus just disappears. So it's really this split second that, that Rembrandt is trying to capture in the work of art here. Um, we can see that there's a great portrayal of expression. We can see this, this older disciple is leaning forward. He's kind of questioning. He's looking. He's amazed at what he's seeing. Um, really, though, the disciples are <coughs> admiring Jesus, and they really aren't. I, I can't really get this sense that they're fully surprised. They're leaning forward a little bit, but they're not really shocked. They're not moving. There's no great motion. And, and Jesus also is very, very posed, very dramatic with this light radiating from his head, this really big, prominent light that is radiating, <coughs> radiating from his head. And so again, there's no color, but we can see the strong contrast of lights and darks and shadow. We can see there's this light source from out here that would have cast a shadow on the dog, on the table, on Jesus as well. You can see a dark background. And we can also see this curtain. Now this is um, a very typical Baroque um, feature of artwork, to have this curtain. Baroque art is very dramatic, very theatrical, very staged. And so Rembrandt is really embracing that theatricality, that drama in the work of art. He wants to, again, Jesus is shown pretty traditionally, but he wants to kind of expand that notion and make this really a scene uh, that's full of drama, very lively, um, kind of stages this scene. So we can see, this, it's almost like the stage-like setting that we're just kind of happening upon this scene. We're, we're looking in at, at actors that are acting it out. Now, Rembrandt's Amsterdam I want to talk about a little bit more as well. Um, as I said before, in 1639, he moved to this humongous house um, that was in a neighborhood that was a really big artist community, and, and it was also becoming the center of Amsterdam's Jewish community. Um, the house, like I said, was huge. It had room for his families, his studios, his, um, his collection of art and curiosities. Um, and, but it really was the neighborhood that he lived in that influenced his, his works of art. Um, at this time, Jews immigrated into the Netherlands from Spain and from Portugal and from Poland and from Eastern <coughs> Europe to escape religious persecution. Um, and they were very, um, very tolerant of various religions at this time in the Netherlands. And so the Jewish community kind of huddled together. Um, there were the Sephardic Jews and the Ashkenazi Jews, so two different communities, but um, they, were, they were accepted. They became merchants. They brought their trades with them. Um, and it really was this great, um, almost melting pot of religions at this time. There was a lot of dialogue about Protestant and Catholic and Jewish religions. And, and people, scholars, um, were, really, were really trying to get dialogue out and to get this conversation started about, about mixing these religions um, and just kind of being more um, tolerant of the religions. Now, Rembrandt, because he lived amongst all of these Jewish neighbors, he asked his Jewish neighbors to model for his Old Testament scenes, which is pretty smart. I mean, the Old Testament really is stories of, of Jews. And so by asking Jewish models to, Jewish, his Jewish neighbors to model for him, he really is trying to, create, to capture this authenticity to, um, to the people and to the scenes that he's trying to represent. Um, and this is really especially significant because for his head of of Christ for the, um, the works that you'll see in the exhibit, those six works, it's thought that he used one of, his, um, one of his Jewish neighbors to model for all of those works of art. And he would have positioned him in different ways, et cetera. But the fact that he's using a live Jewish model is very unusual, and it may have even been unprecedented to depict Jesus as, um, as a Jew, as he, as he was. Um, and so here then, I want to turn to the faces of Jesus. And this is kind of the, the crux of the exhibition, this, this gallery here. Um, so again, between the years of 1648 and 1656, Rembrandt and members of his studio produced eight um, small oil sketches of a young man posed as Jesus, all on oak panels. And so we can see six of those all lined up in the exhibition. The portraits show the same young man. And here I have, I, I just had two, although when I end the presentation at the end, I'll include all six. Um, we can see that they're the same man posed different ways with different expressions on his face, looking different ways. Um, kind of his arms are in a pose that suggests that he, he may be praying um, as well. And he's, Rembrandt is really capturing, trying to capture this, um, really the emotion, the intuitiveness um, of the figure, the humbleness of the figure. Um, these works were not signed, so it's really hard to determine if it was 
Rembrandt himself who made these works, or maybe it was um, one of his students, and he would have um, he would have kind of oversaw the work um, of the of these Christs. Um, these also were not meant for the market, which is pretty pretty significant as well. There was no patron saying, "I want I want a bunch of panels of Jesus." Rembrandt is really um, really is taking this subject matter really personally, and he's not creating it for a particular reason, except he really wants to get it right. He really wants to do something unique and different and really personal. And so it suggests that later in Rembrandt's life, he really wanted to kind of, he really was becoming more spiritual, more, um, more religious as well. And so we look to this new Jesus as this kind of um, way in which to relate. Um, he could identify with this Jesus whereas he couldn't really identify with the canonical, posed, rigid, godlike image of Jesus that had, predece predece um, that had come before this. Um, and so also what's significant is two of these um, works of art, and I'll ex expand a little bit more about the Detroit Institute of Art, Head of Jesus. They were incorporated in um, his other famous works of art as well. We can see particularly how this Head of Jesus was really... Um, painted exactly in, in some of his other works of art. Now we can also see here, if we go back to the Lentulus letter, we can see some of those same elements that we saw before. So he's not totally disregarding the tradition that had come before him. But we can see that the hair, again, is the color of a ripe hazelnut. There's blonde highlights all throughout in here. And in here we can see the blonde highlights. Hair is still parted on the top, still falling straight to the ears with curls um, falling to the shoulders. And then his glance also shows simplicity adorned with maturity. We can really, I mean, we can really get, if we look at these eyes, I mean, they just tell us a whole story right, right in the eyes themselves. And so he's really trying to get this emotional um, response from the viewer, but this emotion from Jesus as well. Jesus um, is shown as contemplative. He's shown as gentle and tender and empathetic. He really starts to look human in these pictures. He's not so much this idealized, really muscular God, um, really could be one of us. Now here we have the Supper at Emmaus, and this is from 1648, so right around the time of the, the panels of the head of Jesus. And this is really unique that we have this work because this has not been exhibited in the United States for 75 years. The last time it was here was 1936. It's been recently cleaned and restored, and so it really is wonderful to see this in comparison to the other heads of Jesus. Um, because, well, first of all, let me, let me just, again, we have another supper at Emmaus scene. And here, Rembrandt is depicting it totally different than what had come before. Um, now first, again, this Detroit Institute of Art head of Jesus, we can see that it really influenced the Supper at Emmaus head of Jesus that we see in, in, in this painting along here. So he's using these heads of Jesus in his other artwork to inform his other artwork as well. And I also then, to draw this compare and contrast between Rembrandt's early Jesus and Rembrandt's later Jesus, I, I want to bring up again the print, the 1634 print, and compare it to the 1648 painting. And so here we can see that in the early representation of Christ at Emmaus, we have these really emphatic gestures here, these strong arms here. There's this drama that we talked about, this staged theatricality. Narrative was very important as well. We can see, you know, we can see what's happening within the scene here. Light, again, Rembrandt is always really interested in light, but light really kind of, Rembrandt, Rembrandt could have painted light as another character in the artwork here, really has an identity in the, the work of art. Um, and then also Jesus, he's breaking the bread and we can see that it's an active action, that he, it's an active force. And so to contrast that with the later supper at Emmaus, we can see that first of all, the setting is more austere and simple and the people are a little more austere and simple. There's no great curtain, we're rather in this niche here. Now sometimes artists will depict a, a third I guess a fourth figure. This would have been a servant who would have served um, the table, set the table. And sometimes artists d depict them because this servant did not recognize Jesus even when he broke the bread. And so the artist then can contrast 
the, the moment of, of understanding and recognition in the two disciples, they can contrast that with the servant who is just going about his business and just thinks that this is just another man here. So we can see that the, the setting is more austere and simple. It's more subtle. It's not, as, not quite as dramatic or theatrical. It's humble. And it's really this hushed atmosphere that we can see within the work. Also, the narrative was less important. Um, rather, Rembrandt was really more interested in capturing the psychological human experience of Jesus. Um, he really seeks, instead of going outward, he really wants to find out what's happening inward, and he wants to depict that so the viewer can, can really identify with Jesus. He focuses on the human mind and the human soul. And Jesus, whereas here Jesus is an active presence, Jesus in the later um, representation is more of a serene presence in the midst of dramatic events. We can see these two figures here. This guy, I, mean, I love this guy. He's leaning back. He's kind of shocked. He just recognized him. And, and this, this disciple has his arms raised almost as in prayer. And it's right at that moment where they recognize him and Jesus is about to disappear. And so, but we can see that there's this, really this simplicity, this quietness, this stillness within the figure of Jesus, even despite all of the action that's going on. Now, I also want to just quickly mention, again, a little bit about these works of art and what they meant to Rembrandt. Here we have what would have been Rembrandt's bedroom. We can see the bed in the corner here, the fireplace, some chairs. And the bedroom at the time of Rembrandt really was a multi-purpose room where people would have slept, they would have gathered, um, and people would have also kept their most cherished items within the bedroom. Um, now, when Rembrandt went bankrupt in 1656, which was not a very good thing to happen to Rembrandt, which is great for art historians because there was an inventory that was created of all of the, the works of art that Rembrandt, and all of the belongings that Rembrandt had in his house. And not only were they listed, but they were broken down by the room where they appeared in his house. And so from the inventory, we know that one head of Christ, drawn from life, was found in his smaller studio. And we know that two heads of Christ by Rembrandt were located in his bedroom. Now, I said how the bedroom was really this, most cher this place where you would keep your most cherished items, your most personal space, kind of your inner sanctum. And the fact that Rembrandt kept two of the heads of Jesus in this most personal and private of spaces really shows that he is connecting with Jesus, that he really is um, becoming more spiritual and, and personally connected to this figure. It's not just a study, um, an artwork study, but there really is this religious transformation that's happening in Rembrandt as well. Now I'm quickly going to run through the last three rooms of the exhibition. Here we have the 100 guilder print that I talked about earlier, the work that, um, that sold, the print that sold for 100 guilders. And this really is considered to be Rembrandt's most celebrated work on paper. It's the largest and his most ambitious print. And there are many versions of it, which is nice. With prints, you, you create a print, and then you can make multiple versions. You can ink the plate differently. And so there isn't just one. And we're really fortunate in the exhibition where there, we actually have two. We have this one from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and we have one from the, the Philadelphia Museum of Art's permanent collection. And they're right catty corner in the same corner. And so you can see how, I suggest you go and, and look at the printmaking video to really understand the process. And then come out and look at each of the, the two prints of the 100 guilder print and see the differences and the subtleties and the, the shading and the inking and, and how they're similar and yet how they're different. So really I challenge you to look a little bit harder at these two works here because it is neat and unique to have two works, two works of art of the same scene, just different versions in the same exhibition. Um, I'm going to run through this. Um, so we also then have um, the seventh room, like I said, is Rembrandt and the story of Emmaus, where that same story is drawn out again and again by Rembrandt's studio, by his students. Um, and then there are also are some of his other religious um, paintings as well and, and works of art in that gallery. And then in the last gallery, we have Jesus and Rembrandt's late work. And that also expands to um, Jesus and Rembrandt's students as well. Um, this is by Johann Ulrich Meyer. And he was one of the artist's pupils. And um, what's really neat is that, um, so this realistic depiction of Jesus that really had not been done very much before, especially by using a, a Jewish model. Um, this was 
really it was actually criticized at the time. I said before how not all art is loved when it's created, and a lot of people didn't like that Rembrandt was breaking with tradition when he was making these heads of Jesus. And um, most of his students did not really um, take up that same idea that Rembrandt did. Um, but this, this particular student, Meyer, did. And what we have here is this really unique um, painting where he not only is um, adopting Rembrandt's new visage of Jesus, and he's not only, again, looking more internal and more of this emotional response, but he also is, he's not copying one of Rembrandt's works, so he's really doing this on his own. So we can see that Rembrandt has, um, has kind of spread into this, this um, really fervor that Rembrandt has in, in his works with Jesus, really has spread to his followers as well. And so we can see that he's starting this tradition of portraying Jesus not traditionally as well. So with all of this in mind, um, I'm going to end my, my talk for now. Um, and here we can see those six heads of Jesus that you'll see side by side in the wall in the exhibition. But I want to um, thank you again and ask if you have any, any questions for me about the exhibit or about anything that I may have talked about today. Yes, that's a good question. So in the world of museums, not everything is easy. And you have a lot of um, dealing with, not only with museums, whether they want to loan out a work of art or um, whatever the case, but you also have some um, legal loaning issues. And so one of the works of art was supposed to be included in the exhibition, but there was some kind of a legal issue with, I can't even remember what country it was that was going to send it. And so we weren't able to include it in the exhibition. So we kind of had to make a last minute adjustment by not including it. But um, if any of you decide to go into the museum world, um, you will know that it is, it would be lovely if we could just you know, just like we do a Google image search, right, and throw all these images up together. It would be wonderful if we could do that, but there's a lot of um, regulations with loaning a work of art. Also, you have private collectors sometimes who don't want to loan out their works of art or museums who are exhibiting the works of art elsewhere as well. So it's a good question. Thank you for asking. Yeah. That's good. Probably because, yes. Uh, okay, so if Rembrandt was not commissioned to make these works of art, if he created them more for himself, why were students also doing the same thing? And that really is probably for, for practice, because he would have wanted his students, because his students would have worked on religious, bigger religious paintings, um, bigger religious works. And, um, and so we would have wanted them to have the same kind of practice as well. But the fact that he's really concentrating and asking his studio to concentrate on this new depiction of Jesus is really, really great. And, and like I mentioned in the last image, we can see that some students are really embracing that and doing it on their own, and, and some aren't at all. So that's a really good question, too. Thank you. Yes. That's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. There were not nearly as many um, religious commissions, and so I think that left him, if he, because he did want to explore these religious um, works and these religious stories and these religious figures, I mean, really, this study of Jesus, he... Jesus is the most studied figure that Rembrandt studies and that Rembrandt captures in his works of art. So he was really infatuated with Jesus as a person, Jesus as a religious figure, Jesus in the stories as well. And so um, I'm not sure how that related to the overall greater um, Protestant Reformation, um, but I do know that because there weren't as many commissions for religious works of art, it is pretty remarkable that he still had this great um, religious output as well. Is there a question over? Oh, um, I was just wondering if Rembrandt ever received any like, great hostility from any specific group of government or religious authority. Well, 
No, the only time he really received, well, the only couple of times he received hostility from the government was one when he went bankrupt and couldn't pay his bills. Um, and the second one was when he had that legal issue with his former mistress um, and she sued him and, and um, they went before, I believe it was, she, I can't even remember the whole story. I know that since he wasn't a member of the church, he wasn't kicked out of a church, but she was kicked out of a church for, for that. Um, but no, I don't, I don't know of any that I don't know of any churches or religious groups or whatever the case that would have reacted one way or the other to the works, except that I do know that I, I don't know religious groups, but I know a lot of people were taken aback by these new portrayals of Jesus, that they didn't like them because they weren't what had been traditionally depicted before. It's, I mean, it's kind of funny. I, you know, if I paint a picture of an apple and nobody, none of you see an apple, you're going to use my apple, my drawing as as the model. And so that essentially is what's done. I mean, we have these, these, these sources, these um, images, the Vale of Veronica, the Mandelian, we have the Lentulus letter, but they're really, I mean, they're also a little bit questionable, but we really have this long line of tradition that I'm copying what he did because he did it before me and because it was accepted. And so um, be, by Rembrandt not doing that and also because he was using one of his Jewish neighbors, I mean, that was also very radical at the time. Yeah, thank you. Faculty. I didn't mean faculty couldn't ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> students first. So, if faculty want to ask now as well, feel free. Or other students. Yes. Does it make any difference that Jesus is a head is usually tilted? You know, I have not read anything about that. Um, I really think these were meant to be models for to use in, in other works of art. We saw that really with the Detroit artwork here. Um, and so, I think he's really interested in having this model posed in a numer numerous different ways, numer by looking up, by looking down, by turning his face to one side or the other side, or tilted up or tilted down. I think he's really more interested in trying to capture this inner emotion of Jesus. Um, I don't know that there is any significance to the way that he is depicted, but I know that these would have been um, meant to inform his works and meant to be kind of studies about the face, what could be the face of Jesus. So, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. is, is, there a, is there one work or even, uh, let's say, a series of works in, in his uh, production that really launched his career? In other words, is there, a, <clears throat> is there a work we can look at and say, this sort of made his reputation? That's interesting. I, I was toying around with the idea of including um, The Night Watch, which is a really um, famous, well-known painting by Rembrandt, which was... Um, and I, I apologize, I, I don't remember too much about it because it, it's been a while since I've studied my basic art history. But it was, um, probably it was one of his most famous works. Um, it also, there also, um, I'm trying to think, that may have been, it was a night watch, it was meant to portray military soldiers and it was at, it was thought to, it was called the night watch because it was thought to be the nighttime. Really it was just darkened um, dirt that kind of came on it and it was n really lighter than, it. He painted it lighter than how it looked, but because of the years, it kind of made it more darker. Um, and that, I know, was very well received by the, by the community. There also, I'm not sure who the patron was. He was, um, he was commissioned to make, to create works of art by royal courts, um, and so that also launched his career. Um, and when he got to Amsterdam, I can't remember the name, but there was a particular patron who was very well known and asked him to paint portraits of him, and so that also helped. But if there's one particular work, I don't, I don't know if there is. Thank you. Yes. Do you know when Jesus was first depicted with blue eyes? Mm. Can you repeat the question? Do you? Oh, thank you. Do you know? Do I know when Jesus was first depicted with blue eyes? And I, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's fun. I mean, in all of these images. Go back. Okay. They're all brown. Yeah. I don't know. That's a great research topic. Somebody, if somebody wants to take it up, I don't, I don't know. Yes. Not by Rembrandt, but that's another very good question. Um, what is the question. The question is: Are there any other um, portraits by Rembrandt um, of Jesus? Is that what you're asking, or just? We, 
do we have any of his other portraits in the museum? We don't have any other of his portraits in the museum on view. We have a lot, not a lot, but we have um, a decent amount of his prints um, and his drawings, which are not able to be on view as much as paintings are just because of various um, reasons. And so they're in our storage facilities. Um, the one, the 100 Gilder print, which I showed that the, there is, we do own a copy of that, and that was taken out of storage. It was conserved, so it was cleaned and, and made, um, made better, and it was researched, and it was included in the exhibition. Um, we do, however, um, have a great, at the, at the very end of the exhibit, so you drop off your audio tours, and there's this long hallway that takes you from the end of the exhibit into the, um, into the exhibition store. And on this long hallway are about 15 to 20 different close-up images of Jesus from the permanent collection. And so they're not by Rembrandt, only the one in the exhibit is by Rembrandt that we have included in there. But it's this long line um, that traces back the image of Jesus in various parts of the museum's permanent collection. And so you can actually take the handout. And it's really fascinating to see how artists of different areas, different times, um, different backgrounds have depicted Jesus. And so you can take that handout, has the gallery listing for where they're all located, and you can go to that gallery and you can look really up close as well. So you can do further ex exploration about Jesus and the image of Jesus within the permanent collection too. Are there any other questions? You have some good questions for me, and I apologize, I couldn't answer all of them. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. <laughs>